Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business of Drinks. My name is Tang and I'm calling in from Singapore. Hey, hey, hey! Well, my name is David, calling in from Australia, and we have an awesome guest coming up, and he is the CEO of Binance Australia, Lee Travis. Before we get him on, don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on all, all social media. Also, we have a great mailing list. There's a lot of signups already. Uh, we provide tips. We give you episode updates and so forth. You can follow us in the newsletter. And just a quick disclaimer, I've bought crypto from Binance in the past, Tung hasn't, and this is not a sponsored interview. We, we were just interested in speaking to Lee and he agreed to come on. So now I'd like to introduce our fantastic guest. Lee is currently working on growing crypto adoption in Australia as the CEO of Binance Australia. Binance Australia is a compliant and progressive Australian fintech that empowers customers and corporate institutions to access al alternative low-cost digital assets and products. Since Lee has joined Binance Australia, the business has grown to over 1 million Australian clients and has launched Binance Australia derivatives to offer wholesale clients crypto derivatives. Prior to Binance Australia, Lee was involved in public equity markets, having served as managing director for ASX-listed Digital X LTD, as well as a brief role as non-executive of Aura Fat Projects, which went through a 115 million NASDAQ listing. While Lee was at the helm of Digital X, the company had a number of highlights, including being the first public company to hold Bitcoin as a treasury asset, launching crypto funds for wholesale investors, and advising a number of crypto startups. Lee has been involved full time in crypto markets since 2014 and was a director of Blockchain Australia for five years years all right welcome to the show lee travis thanks for coming on how are you doing really really good thanks for the invitation to come on yeah and no, we're excited to have you on lee i mean i think we've been wanting to have uh guests like you and you specifically actually on our show for a little bit now um so this is going to be really interesting and i think really cool but before we start what we usually do is we kind of have this little thing about drinks uh that we're having and uh just so everyone knows it's a monday afternoon so you know, I'm not drinking a whiskey uh, or gin, which I normally do. Uh, maybe we can start. Lee, Lee what, what are you drinking? I actually just went for lunch with uh, a friend that works at Crypto Spend. Um, so it was a crypto lunch and I took a, a takeaway latte from Shelter Cafe down in here in, in Lennox Head, which is one of my favorite cafes to go to. Nice. Yeah, awesome. Dave, we'll what in show notes. <laughs> Dave, what about you, man? Yeah, so I was having a conversation with one of our previous guests, uh, Jace Tan, this morning about coffee versus tea. I was telling her I'm really into coffee now. And she said, you know what? Green tea has caffeine also. And whereas coffee is more like a uh, buzz high, green tea is more like a focused concentration high. She said, try green tea for a bit. So I'm trying green tea right now instead of whiskey. There you go. And instead of whiskey, I'm drinking water because I've got important meetings coming up in a little bit, so I can't go slightly drunk. I've been I've been warned against it multiple times. <laughs> Look at all of us uh, <laughs> professional professionals doing the right thing. No whiskey I, on a Monday. I mean, I, I no think one I can, can see inside our here. glasses. <laughs> <laughs> it's how we hide it. Um, I mean, yeah, so we're really excited, Lee, and we're also we're cognizant of your time because we also know that you're really busy. So, um, and it's a Monday afternoon. So Dave, why don't you kick us off with the questions, man? Yeah, so firstly, very curiously, how did you get the role of CEO of Binance Australia? It, um, it was actually an opportunity that presented itself. Um, the sort of incumbent CEO had resigned to move on to a, a new venture, um, which ironically was in a, a field that I was already involved in, which was crypto funds management. Uh, and one of the stakeholders at, at Binance mentioned there was an open opportunity and that I should apply. And Binance was a place that, um, yeah, I knew quite a lot about. I, I told a friend several years before that working at Binance would be a, a dream job opportunity. And I guess when that came up, I, I definitely had to apply. It was a super rigorous process. There was five interviews. Um, so really diligent. I got to meet quite a lot of the Binance stakeholders I think only one of the interviews was with someone in Australia and the final interview was with CZ, 
which was absolutely a thrill. And um, yeah, I, I made it through and and joined. I think on the Monday after I resigned from my uh, previous job on the Friday. So just straight into it. Oh wow, no breaks at all. Oh, that's pretty cool. I mean. <laughs> I can understand why I mean, it's, it's pretty fast moving and you kind of got to step into a really serious role. Right. Um, but how has it been? I mean, you've been, you've been at, you've been at it for a few months now. How's it been so far? Like what are any pitfalls, any, any, ish, anything that, you know, it's kind of been up and down. Yeah. I think the market's obviously been the big one that's been up and down. Um, been in the role probably 18, 19 months now. So it's, um, it's really felt like a, a third career. My, my first one was in you know, traditional markets, public markets. Second was with, um, uh, a publicly listed uh, crypto company, Digital X, involved in mining, crypto mining, uh, blockchain development, uh, funds management, um, as as well as some advisory of, of crypto startups. But um, yeah, third career has been at, at Binance, and uh, it's been an absolute whirlwind, a thrill, going from servicing hundreds of clients to hundreds of thousands, and, and now a million. And mm-hmm. really, how sort of the change has been for me is, is really been based on sort of the market, based on Binance's strategy. Um, and when I say the market, it's more than just, you know, crypto crypto prices. It's also, you know, what's the regulatory oversight look like? Um, what are the opportunities for, for partnerships? And, you know, whether we should sort of double down on, on servicing our existing client base that, that loves us or go out on, on the brand sponsorship, on the expansion side for, for new companies. It really depends on yeah, the Binance's goals as well as the, the market conditions at a certain time. So at the moment, we're really focused on the regulatory engagement, making sure that Australia's crypto licensing regime sets us up for a long future of uh, having successful crypto companies come out of here, um, as well as also working with our existing client base. So part of that, we've got uh, a roadshow that goes on for this week goes through Queensland, starting off in um, in the Gold Coast, then the Sunshine Coast and, and Brisbane. So super excited to connect with our clients as well as connect with uh, a range of, of Binance Australia staff that I haven't seen for this year in person. That's awesome. You you mentioned, you hinted before about the, the crazy market we're in. Uh, why do you think people should still trust crypto even in this bearish market and even if everyone on social media is saying, scam get out of it i think crypto works you know regardless of of market conditions you can buy crypto you can download a a wallet that will then enable you to transfer that money it could even be a stable coin us dollar scape stable coin you can transfer that money in minutes to anyone in the world for nearly free and that's a compelling use case that's been used now by millions of people worldwide and at scale of billions of dollars per day so that's originally why I first got into the market um, around solving the cross-border money transfer issue. I had a client that was selling some some shares. He was based in Brazil, wanted to sell those on the ASX. And when the funds were transferred to him, it got stuck between the intermediary banks. Uh, it took 10 days to arrive and Murphy's Law meant that the currency depreciated against him by 10%. And it was just simply that the intermediary banks didn't communicate properly. Um, I originally thought Bitcoin would solve that problem, but it looks like blockchain-based money has has moved in for that place and and Bitcoin has a different role um, to some degree. But um, I think crypto absolutely works right now and in the future of what crypto can bring, you know, we've seen a taste of it with with NFTs, for example, digital property rights for anyone in the world. That's going to enable individuals to be creators and monetize their own content and copy like was never possible before uh, and and really enable individuals to compete with some of these major global brands that have dominated data and and dominated, you know, return profiles for content for the last decade or two. So you actually mentioned something quite interesting there. You said that you thought Bitcoin was going to be that, that um, the solution to the problem, but then you said it actually has a different role, right? Do you mind kind of elaborating a little bit on what that role is? Yeah, so I originally thought it'd be you'd convert your local currency dollars to Bitcoin, transfer the Bitcoin across, whether you're in Brazil or the US, and then convert that into local currency. You could do that in a relatively quick period of time, avoid the interchange costs, but 
obviously there is Bitcoin volatility and the conversion costs in a range of platforms are still, you know, relatively high, well, certainly higher than just transferring digital money cross borders that you can do today. Um, so I think Bitcoin was maybe designed as sort of international payments and micro payments, but what we're seeing is Bitcoin being used as that store of value. Uh, it's a, a global currency, um, while maybe Singapore dollar, Australian dollar, US dollar have been, you know, relatively stable. There's dozens of currencies worldwide. And over the longer term, we know that currencies inflate. They're managed by a range of people that don't always have preserving value as the primary goal of a currency. So it's a way of, of holding your value in a currency, which is Bitcoin, which can preserve its value over time. It's cross borders, you can take that with you. Um, it's you know more difficult for things like um, bank bail-ins that you saw in in Cyprus when the government had been spending too much and had mm-hmm. problems and you know quarantined a, a portion of um, individuals' deposits. So you, you've seen time and time again geopolitical events and uncertainty has led to a greater interest in Bitcoin, whether that was Cyprus, whether that was the uh, UK Brexit vote, we saw a big interest increase then. Uh, Hong Kong and China, when those tensions came through, again, additional increase in in Bitcoin interest. So that's telling me that Bitcoin does have that uh, use case, but it's just not necessarily, you know, cross-border transfers. It's more about store of wealth and store of value. Got it. So, got it. so a little bit like the gold. Sorry, sorry, dear. But a little bit like gold, like when it was earlier, when people put their money into gold as a stable kind of uh, way to store their wealth. Absolutely, same right. way. Except you don't have to store it with a centralized institution, or you don't have to, you know, dig that in a hole or, or put that in your home vault, which is very difficult to take with you across borders or on flights, etc. It's uh, a safer way of having dig- of having gold. It's, it's digital gold. It's Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. So, so what we have Bitcoin on one side, and then what would be the other element of the puzzle of cross-border transfers? What, what's an option there for in the crypto space? Well, there's a range of stable coins. They're not central bank digital currencies. They are issued by private companies, some of which under license. So Tether is the world's largest stable mm-hmm. coin. Uh, it's the most actively used. Um, you've also now got some more regulated stable coins, for example, USDC, um, which through Circle, I think almost was going public recently. And then you've also got BUSD, which is issued by Binance in partnership with, with Paxos. Um, and that's another stable coin with tens of billions of dollars of, uh, of capital that's, that's tied into that backed one to one with currency sitting in banks. So it's you know arguably more safe than uh, than utilizing a bank which operate on a fractional basis. Mm-hmm. Um, we have seen that in other countries, but um, you know I think countries like Australia that have the government bank guarantee up to two hundred and fifty k, most in Australia would argue that it, it's safer to have bank deposits than stable coins. Um, we have obviously seen some challenges with stable coins. Uh, particularly the algorithmic stable coins. Yeah. I think it's really important that you do look into the detail of which stable coin you're buying and holding and using because, um, yeah, there, there definitely are some, some major differences that could be backed by gold, that could be backed by dollars in a bank, that could be backed by treasuries, that could be algorithmically backed and more experimental. So you do need to look at those. But, you know, the market capitalization of these, I think, was, was recently approaching 100 billion and, and certainly still well into the tens of billions now. So I think it's a use case that um, has certainly been proven out um, and will be genuine rivals to a fully fledged central bank digital currency in the future. Private market, I, I think, will, will win that. Now, that's really interesting because I actually have a couple of follow-up questions with regards to the regulations around that. But um, before that, I kind of want to get into one thing that's been uh, maybe not a trending topic globally, but I, I've been seeing it a lot on like podcasts and, and people talking about it, which was the, the pump and dump schemes that seem to be happening a lot in crypto, like NFTs and, and everything like that. Um Like, first of all, like what are your opinions on that? And secondly, is there any way that we can 
uh, stop that? You know, like how do you how do you how do you kind of like how how would you think we should avoid like people falling into those traps? Yeah, I think just generally pump and dumps are terrible. Whether they're in crypto or equities or yeah. NFTs, doesn't matter. Anyone promoting something and and simultaneously selling it is doing a terrible thing, and they should face penalties for that. Um, so. That's one element. Um, the other one is, I think there is more of a focus from regulators around that, particularly in Australia. There's a big crackdown on influencers or influencers, as they've been termed over here. And what we're starting to see, whether it was the you know, dob in an influencer um, process that went through, uh, is, is actually a real change from these paid advocates to disclose who is paying them for what they're doing. So I think that's that's one element to know when someone's being paid or when they're genuinely endorsing a product um, because they love it. That'll help. Disclosure is always key. Um, I also think with some of the on-chain sleuths, so some of the fact that blockchains are immutable, which means that the transactions you make on them are forever stored. The data for analyzing blockchains is getting better and better. There's more people mm-hmm. interested in it and they're being rewarded for doing so. So influencers or anyone that's been pumping and dumping, there's more and more cases of them being found out, losing their entire follower base and facing criminal or civil prosecution. So the penalties are, are getting bigger. More people are being found out. And with blockchain, unlike equities and other assets, yeah, people get found out, whether it's today or in the future, they do get found out, I think, more often than, than in equities, uh, or certainly there's an easier ability to find them out. Um, Binance certainly has a z- zero tolerance for that, where we have trading policies in place that monitor uh, around some of these restrictions to, to, to stop those um, pump and dumps. And the good thing is, I think people are getting smarter. Like they, we did a video about it, but there's this big influencer named Our Show Speed, and he 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 promoted a mate of his who was promoting some NFT pump and dump scheme, and it was it just completely damaged his reputation for some time because everyone was just typing in the message uh, the chat box scam 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 scam, and he you got a lot of crap for it. So thank goodness a lot of people are actually uh, smarter than up to to that kind of stuff. Yeah, good. Uh, I think they should be found out and uh, called to account. Um, so just dialing back a little bit. So Binance, right? So it's managed to emerge as number one in the world in terms of daily trading volumes. In your experience in business, like by, out of all the crypto exchanges in the world, Binance manages to be number one. Right? How, what does it take for one to become number one in, in crypto or, or in any field have you found in your experience in business? Yeah, I think this is my first time being with an industry leader that's absolutely dominating. Had some short periods of of a lot of success. Um, But in terms of this sustained success that Binance is seeing, um, it's it's been fascinating to have sort of a front row seat to that. And I think there's, there's probably three things to it. It is building the right product. Um, so having the right product that consumers want to use, working your butt off, just finance works absolutely tirelessly. Um, I would, uh, it's the hardest working company that I've ever seen. People that are ex Uber, Airbnb, et cetera, all have said that finance's pace is another level of what they're experienced too, in terms of how hard, how fast everyone's working. Um, and the other one would be, you know, the opportunity, the opportunity has got to be there. So Binance came around in 2017, and prior to that, there was two major incumbents. There was Bitfinex, which was a global exchange, uh, predominantly Bitcoin trading, but also some altcoining, big, big market share, I'd say over 40%. And then you had Coinbase, predominantly based in the US. And I think the market opportunity came because Bitfinex had a major security incident in 2016. And that meant that some users did uh, unfortunately have a haircut on the assets they held um, in the short term. And Coinbase, from a product perspective, perhaps they were a little too conservative. So they didn't have that same freedom to access digital asset products like, like Binance had. And that sort of 
um, conservative nature while being the incumbent meant that there was a big opportunity for someone that was, you know, willing to sort of work a little bit faster and um, and build a product that consumers wanted. So, yeah, right product, the um, right market opportunity, and yeah, working working your butt off. I think was the, the three three main solutions. No, that's 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 fascinating because I think it, it's as good as your product is, as good as everything that you do. Because I think that kind of sets you up for success. It also really depends on external factors that you probably don't have a lot of control over that actually can kind of propel you on a global stage to be the market leader. Because I mean, it's it's so big, it's so large, it's it's growing so quickly. You kind of need a lot of things to work out. Look, are you tired of struggling with design software or hiring underwhelming designers? Then it's time to try Dot Yeti. <laughs> with Dot Yeti, you can get top-notch design work without actually even lifting a finger. You know, you just submit your brief and let a team of professional designers work their magic. You know the best part? It won't break the bank, David. It's really, <laughs> really affordable. Really break the bank. Anyway, so if you want to step up your branding game like a boss, like me in turn, give Dot Yeti a shot. Yeah, make sure that you go to our website, business over drinks slash offers, O double F E R S, to see how it works. Do this dot com forward slash offers. I don't care, man. Business over drinks dot com <laughs> slash offers. Trust us, you won't be disappointed. Unless you actually have like having don't like having a team of really talented designers doing your work for really free or cheap, not free, cheap, <laughs> then maybe you will be disappointed. Who knows? Right, this is what you get when we have a scripted ad. But you know what it is. Dot Yeti lets you have a team of talented designers for the cost of less than one. All right, that's pretty much what it does. Check it out. So if you got if you need some professional level design work, but you don't want to pay an agency, you don't want to pay an overpriced person, businessoverdrinks.com forward slash offers. That's right. Make sure to try Dot Yeti now. Just join, just go to our website, have a look, sign up through the link, guys. This will really help us out. And the script says, You won't regret it, bro. That's right. You won't regret it, bro. <laughs> and ma'am. Um so okay, but then then that actually leads quite nicely to the next question is because I have been looking at your doing some research about you in your previous interviews. And one thing that you mentioned was that um there are too many exchanges actually out there. And in, in Australia in particular, we're talking about too many exchanges, right? First of all, like how do you um how do you think that the market will correct itself? And like like why do you think these exchanges aren't, you know, for example, kind of just giving up because they're not going to get significant market share if they're, if they're such a majority leader and you guys are not showing any sign of slowing down. I think it's the entrepreneurial spirit that is hard for a founder to turn around after they haven't had that product market fit or haven't had the scale that they'd hope, hope for. They're, they're always looking to try different different things and so forth and, and that's great. Love to see that, but it's just the nature of being in a, High risk, more volatile arena in a in a bear market that says that uh, the majority will will really struggle um, in a marketplace style business. Mm-hmm. You need to have both sides, both buyers and sellers. And yep. the more liquidity you have, the more customers would rather trade on your venue. I've seen that with the equities markets in Australia. The ASX competes with the National Stock Exchange, the Sydney Stock Exchange, and will have ninety nine point nine percent of all the volume which means the best businesses want to list there and the better traders want to trade there, that liquidity begets liquidity. I think the same applies through for exchanges, um, whether it's the um, you know, few hundred digital currency exchanges that are currently registered in Australia, you know, that's, that's probably too much. Um, I think we'd all, all agree on that. I think some are registered because of the you know, just interpretation of who needs to register as a digital currency exchange and, and part of the new regulation in Australia. We'll see a new licensing regime come through in time. Um, but I think it, it is too many at the moment and consumers need to be protected. So we, we just don't necessarily want um, startups that aren't financially resourced and, and don't have the right security to manage user assets um, sort of pushing through and, and trying to acquire more customers right now. I, I don't think that's going to be healthy for um, Crypto Australia. Yeah, when you when you mention that, it just reminds me of, I'm sure a lot of the trauma people may be going through as a result of FTX. 
So what do you say to investors who are kind of worried that Binance could follow the same steps as FTX? Well, definitely the headlines were out when, when FTX faltered, what was going to happen to Binance. Um, immediate reaction was actually a range of users' assets quickly came to Binance uh, from other platforms because they thought Binance was more secure. And then we saw a reduction in the assets on the platform on Binance's, I think, some reasonably sized institutions left the marketplace. Uh, over the last month or so, we've seen the majority of those assets come back. Um, so in terms of total assets that are sitting on Binance, it's over US 50 billion. And, and Binance has been very public in releasing their wallets, both hot and cold wallets. So those are now tracked by a range of different um, platforms that you can measure in real time where flows are on the business. And I think that that amount of capital really should give investors some confidence that it's a safe place to have your assets. Um, Binance is also committed to holding users' assets one-to-one -one in the way that they enter the platform. And Binance Australia has made assurances as well through Bin uh, Blockchain Australia, which is the industry body here. So in terms of those users' funds, we hold one-to-one. -one. You know, We don't on-lend those to other users, but they're held in our spot and, and futures wallet. So it's uh, a really, really conservative way of, of managing the exchange, but it's served us well. Um, in terms of the audit side, that's really where the market wants us to get to. You know, all the statements, all the financial capabilities, et cetera, um, to have publicly verifiable audits. I think it's a case we're still waiting for the risk appetite of the biggest auditors in the world to say, yes, we're happy to work with private crypto companies. I've seen many different auditors in the space over the last eight years or so, and they've had a, a really limited up, um, appetite even for, for public crypto companies. For private, it's, it's more of a challenge, but I'm involved in some auditing work here, um, some significant prep, 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 uh, prep auditing work that's been happening overseas, um, I'm aware of. And then for Australia, we actually went through a financial audit for the derivatives business that has an AFSL over here. So very familiar with that process. I know the direction Binance is going. It's more transparency, more oversight. Uh, and I think there's a, enough detail that Binance has released publicly for users to say Binance feels like a pretty safe place to store my assets. No, that's that's good to hear because I think there's, a, there's still a lot of misconception, I think, kind of rumors going around and like just people just kind of like talking about what what the market's like and, and what crypto really is about because people just don't know it for the most part, uh, apart from the early adopters and people kind of like a little less risk of us, right? Uh, but I mean, saying that, right, you guys hit a million customers in Australia, which is, which is insane because Australia is really not that big of a market. And you guys like smash through like a million customers. That's awesome penetration. But like, do you see a ton of potential for growth in that market? Absolutely, a million customers trusting Binance Australia. That was a thrill and, and really a highlight for last year to cap off the year. I think we announced that in December and we gave away a Bitcoin as part of that and had a huge amount of uh, engagement. Um, it just came after we crossed 100,000 social followers as well for the, for the local um, uh, social media accounts. So, yeah, a few milestones to, to cap off 2022 for us. Um, in terms of the Australian market, it's, it's a bit unique. Uh, for one, Australians are very interested in investing. Uh, there's around 9 to 10 million Australians that invest in the stock market in equities. So I'm looking at the you know, sort of next three years or so, total addressable market being about 50% of that. So potentially, yeah, 4.5 million Australians would be interested in crypto if, if things play out the way I expect it to. Um, there's... Also, a unique situation in Australia where self-managed super funds can direct their own retirement investment portfolios into crypto if they feel that it meets their risk appetites and retirement goals, etc. Um, and that's, I believe, pretty unique to Australia. Maybe there's only a couple of other countries that would allow that. And that pool of capital is in the hundreds of billions. So huge amount of, of untapped investment potential there. If the right sort of controls and governance and education comes through for crypto, I think Australia's got a huge amount of upside. 
Mm. Not nice. That's insane. That's well, I was expecting like, oh, it's going to grow a little bit, but then you're just like, oh no, hundreds of billions of you untapped dominate. resources out there it grow three to four times in a small market. I was like, damn, yeah, that's great. Team Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Come, come from a marketing background, I'm curious, what would your, if that was your, your objective, right, to, to get that much penetration into, into, into Binance, into, into the market, what would your priority be in terms of choosing how, how to get this message across, how to, get, how to convert uh, ASX investors into, into Binance investors? I think education's a big piece of that. So it's not just digital ads and Super Bowl ads that you may have seen in the past, it's it's education. So Binance has got the Binance Academy, which is fantastic, a huge amount of resources there for learning about blockchain, learning about crypto. Um, and we're looking to formalize that. So there was a significant contribution from Binance towards um, the University of Western Australia to, to formalize that crypto and blockchain education. So really excited about that partnership, which will come through for the next, next few years. And we're in discussions with a range of other universities throughout Australia to really sort of formalise that crypto education. So education is one part of it. The other one is more transparency and and um, and disclosure. So Binance Australia is actually the world's first digital currency exchange to be an ESG reporting entity. And, and what that means is really gives us a, a platform as a private company to talk about all the positive elements that are coming through on some of the governance that's been put in place, some of the controls, risk management, some of the details around our licensing, the um, regular, regulator engagement that's been happening, um, gives us a platform to be able to talk through that. Uh, on the social contribution um, as well, I talked about education, but Binance Australia is really focused on being a, a force for good. So we've got a fantastic diverse team in Australia. Um, we've been able to contribute to quite a lot of uh, really worthwhile causes in Australia, uh, one of which was the Sydney Film Festival. Um, great to support artists through here in Australia. The other one was um, through tree planting um, on the back of the bushfires. Binance has pledged a million dollars for planting trees and I think we've already planted over 40,000 trees for koalas um, in their native habitat and there'll be plenty more um, to be announced on the back of that. Um, so, yeah, really across education, social contributions, some of the governance side, um, we've released a quarterly report on, on ESG. Uh, and uh, alongside that, I, I do think the recent introduction of derivatives as sort of another way of, of being able to, as a wholesale investor, so a more experienced trader that meets the wealth test, et cetera, um, is being able to hedge their crypto positions. Um, so if you're looking to take a large position, don't necessarily want to trade that. You can use derivatives to sort of hedge that volatility. And that just brings more sophisticated traders in that I used to say more public markets, mm. currency markets, et cetera, just expanding that, that sort of total pull um, away from maybe some of the early crypto adopters that um, maybe the media talks about where we're really seeing now quite a, a diverse range of, of market entrants towards um, becoming a Binance Australia customer. Yep. Well, that's fascinating because I think you're, you're, you're kind of, because earlier, as, like you mentioned, I mean, rather subtly, like how people like would sponsor the Super Bowl, that, that little, um, uh, what was it, QR code that they put up there on the screen, I think, I believe that's what happened. Yeah, there's a, it's more gimmicky than actually like trying to really do education and kind of grow a market, grow market understanding and market acceptance. Which is which yeah. is interesting. I mean, I, I I like the way you guys are doing it because that's going to be long term success with, versus like, let's get a let's get you know hundred thousand customers in one hour, right? That's not valuable for you guys in the long no, term. No, I was certainly in it for the long term. Um. So, like, coming back, I think I mentioned I really want to talk about regulation. So, um, what are your like? What are, first of all, what are your thoughts on regulation for crypto? Because I, I've I've been reading up about it a bit, doing research, but also I've been interested in it beforehand. And there's a lot of conversation around it. Secondly, is like, are we actually in a position to create a like local regulatory frameworks for every market? Because that's kind of how it is for the financial markets. Every market has its own different regulatory framework. Is it the same for crypto? But crypto is a global, like a global thing, right? It's e e transferable across markets. How do you kind of see that working? I think, you know, regulators are, uh have a jurisdiction over local markets and 
it's not going to stop because there's a new technology that that'll still be in play. But a collaboration that goes on between regulators on a global front has certainly increased as a result of, of crypto. Um, and hopefully that'll help to get uh, a more common set of regulations mm -hmm. so that businesses can operate in multiple markets rather than just one. We do see at the moment in Australia, for example, where there's some, some regulatory arbitrage where you know, international stablecoin issuers can, can operate into Australia, where there's you know, derivatives trading platforms that can market directly to Australians without local licenses, compliance teams, et cetera, without the reporting standards that you'd want to see. So I think from a regulation point of view, I'd like to see some more regulation, one from a, a business point of view, just so that Australian businesses can compete on an um, equal playing field. But more importantly, I'd like to see regulation so we don't have any more of these issues where consumers lose their money through the result of um, you know, poor management, poor operation, outright fraud, etc. There needs to be more oversight and regulation over individuals that operate crypto. Um, so there's fit and proper checks. There is um, a licensing regime so that there's financial capital tied up into these platforms so that if there is something that goes wrong, there's a pool of capital to direct to users in the event of emergency. Binance has set aside over a billion dollars US for those particular issues. Um, but I also think alongside the increase in regulation, we do need to acknowledge that this is a, a relatively nascent market and there's going to be a lot more growth and, and changes to come. You know, I think in the field of say NFTs, where we're only just working out how they could be used for digital property rights to put onerous regulation around that now could really stifle the growth. That could be as, as big as, you know, exchanging all the world's sort of asset trading, tokenization of real world assets, digital identity, everything like that uh, under a restrictive licensing regime that hasn't mapped out how that looks. I, I don't want to see that. Um, things like airdrops as well, where you can say incentivize a user base uh, or early adopter user base with a small amount of um, incentive tokens, etc. I'd, I'd also like to see that excluded. I think that's a really novel way of, of jump starting a, a startup to compete with you know global players that have been incumbents and, and legacy operators that haven't always looked after their customers and haven't given them them any upside in the business from you know, being a huge contributor to that, I'd really love to see that sort of ruled out. Um, and I also think that um, these, you know, regulations need to come through as early as possible. It's, it's been really sort of lingering on for quite some time now. I know in Australia, they are planned for, for coming through this year. So yeah, if that comes through, we'll continue to engage quite collaboratively with regulators and with the government ministers so that Think we get a fit for purpose regulatory regime you're awesome i think there are a million things i can kind of deep dive into from what you said but we're very mindful of your time lee so i'll just do some a few wrap-up questions you know what are some top three books that have positively impacted your life because we do have a, a book section on our podcast where we do like to to learn about the books that that have impacted our guests so are there any you'd like to share with us yeah, in terms of books that have positively impacted my life, uh, I would definitely say um, Built to Last, which is um, mm. sort of the secret habits of some of the world's biggest companies, the most visionary companies, um, yep. sort of touch through how they've been able to be successful over over decades. And and that one really sticks out. One, for just the, uh, the sort of the process these businesses have been through and, and sort of the success they've had, but also because it referenced Kodak which kind of tells you that you always need to be on top of that as well and, and manage that um, in terms of your business moat into the future. There's always risks and disruptions coming, so it's a bit of a reminder for me. Um, the other one, just sort of being more involved in business and probably being more analytical and, and now being in a role where I'm more of a people manager, I think the, the five love, love languages. Five love um, languages, that's an interesting one. That's had a big impact on me, like just personal relationships and understanding that people are very different. If you feel some type of way by how someone's treating you, it yeah. may not be you know, their intention to do so. There's, 
Mm. Humans are very discreet, different people that require different things. And the more that you uh, communicate and learn about someone, you know, the, the different that they actually, the, the more difference they actually have. And uh, I think generally all people or most, the vast majority of people are really positive meaning. So just, just, sort of just give quickly, you what's your love language? Uh, physical touch and words of yeah. affirmation. Most people have two. Yeah, okay. You're a good man, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, can't, I can't touch you, but I'll just reach forward. But yeah. I'll take it, it, should be, it, should, it, should be, it should be the other way, Dave. It's not, you are not supposed to touch. <laughs> <laughs> no touch for you. <laughs> uh, and the final one, you mentioned, yeah, three. Um, I'll, I can direct you to, to CZ's book list. So CZ and, and some of the other Binance founders have put together a, a book list book recommendations online yeah. and um yeah it touches across business and uh and life humanity uh, a range of different things so i'll um give you some inspiration there there's probably about 25 or 30 books there yeah great thanks oh nice okay no that's really interesting and yeah so we've got a couple of other stuff so um you mentioned that you actually have an upcoming uh queensland roadshow right australia roadshow yes Could you tell us a little bit more about that one it's in-person events. It's probably the favorite thing about uh, working at Binance Australia is getting to um, hang out with Binance Australia customers, partners, affiliates, everything like that, as well as the team. And we've had really successful ones in Sydney, uh, in Melbourne, in, um, in South Australia, and, and now we're off to Queensland. Three events in three days, starting in, in Gold Coast, at uh, Burley Heads, then go to the Sunshine Coast and finally in Brisbane. So that's Tuesday to Thursday of this week. And I think there's five of us from, from Binance Australia and hopefully three or 400 uh, customers that will come across. Where, where do we, um, how can people find out more about the, the roadshow and sign up? Uh, it's on our socials. Probably Twitter is the best place. Yep. Um, and if you're desperate for a ticket, just DM, DM the Binance Australia account and uh, I'm sure they'll be able to work something out for you. We'll link to that in our show notes. Um, also, we prior to this this interview, we had a bit of a pre chat, and then I was telling, and uh, I was thinking about tax time, right? Because during tax time, I do have full disclosure, I do have some crypto in Binance, and during tax time, I had the hardest time easily finding tax reporting through it. Do you, is there is there a solution that's coming up for for tax returns? I think I think the reporting from Binance is getting better over time. Yep. So you can now download a larger sort of uh, time window of your transaction history across the range of products. And, you know, we've worked with other sort of vendors in the market. Uh, we've done a lot of AMAs about how the reporting could look and what you should do. Um, some great solutions out in the market. But um, Binance is working on a solution as well. And I know it's live in a couple of countries. So if you keep asking us across socials, et cetera, I'm sure that'll be enough ammunition for me to say, let's put Australia on next for the, uh, the product roadmap and we can get our tax reporting all done via a couple of clicks of the button on Binance for free. All right, everyone, let's do it. Let's do it. I, I think you made Dave really excited when you said it was for free. He was like, okay. Cool. <laughs> I think it's for free. That's what I'm being told. But um, yeah, Binance generally is either free or market leading in terms of pricing. So I know for sure it'll be very, very competitive, if not free. Awesome. Awesome. Anything else that you kind of want to share with our audience? No, I, th I think, you know, we probably talked a lot about, you know, what the last sort of 12 months sort of brought us in terms of some of the challenges and, and how that felt from a, is this, um, you know, Armageddon or is this sort of the blood on the streets that, that people like to, to look out for, some of the contrarian buyers and, I think we've probably had everything thrown at us, right, last year. Um, so much so that when Genesis announced bankruptcy, uh, the market actually went up a little bit. So it, it sort of tells you what the sort of sentiment was. It was, it was certainly at rock bottom. Uh, and I do hope that uh, if, if things can continue in terms of uh, the businesses that are now in the market, learning those lessons from, from businesses that didn't do the right thing, um, the market's going to continue to grow, et cetera. So... I think the outlook's really, really positive and, yeah, looking forward to um, setting 2023 up, um, yeah, with a bang. I've heard people say this before, but it's kind of like the dot-com bubble, right? They, it just filtered out all the trash, but now the, 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 
the companies and the the projects with the good fundamentals are finally going to get the limelight and and we'll, we'll get the value that 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 crypto con- or that the crypto actually has yeah no it definitely does it sort of proves out you know product market fit where there was more of a marketing and hype focus and now where there's a, a genuine interest from from users as well so it's actually easier to be involved in the market now because yeah, you don't have those distractions and it's easy to see through some of the on-chain tools, et cetera, what the sort of real real action is. So, um, yeah, looking forward to a great year, I think. Awesome, Dave. You want to take us out, man? Yeah, thanks for, thanks again for coming on the show, Lee. So we'll have show notes of all the important links we mentioned in this episode. And uh, obviously we will put information about Binance there. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Lee, and uh, we hope to keep in touch. Thanks to Business Over Drinks. Thanks, mate. Oh, we're, we're using that. We're clipping them. That's all they use. <laughs> <laughs> we get endorsed by Lee Travis of my next show. <laughs> <laughs>